Go forth, Julie. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, folks. So um, I'll give you a little background about myself. Um, I'm the director of preservation for the Durable Restoration and Durable Slate Companies, Durable Group, I guess, if you want to call them. Um, and incidentally, and I don't think that uh, when I was asked, you all know this, but I was an interpreter for about uh, seven, eight years um, at several different locations in the um, Virginia and DC area. And it is my one true passion. Um, I always say, you'll know I've won the lottery when I'm back giving tours. So I'm, uh, I, it's truly a, um, such a fun thing to do and educating the public is so, so important to me. Um, and I'm lucky to work for a company who advocates that. So it's great. Now I'm going to um, talk about a few different things and kind of how you all can utilize certain tools and maybe certain mindsets to educate the public about historic structures or historic buildings, specifically, of course, in Frederick. Um, I've, I've actually, with Durable, done a great deal of work in Frederick, but I'm going to be focusing on the two churches I've worked on, um, which is the All Saints Episcopal Church and the Evangelical Lutheran Church, um, which we are just finishing up on if my brass railing will just get delivered, you know, shipping delays have been really quite difficult to deal with, but we're just about done. So I guess when we get the, um, what I'd like to talk about first is just basically the restoration that I did on each of those projects. Um, and then again, I, since the PowerPoint's not up, I'll just talk first about kind of those three things that I think are really important to educate about historic preservation. And I wrote um, and, and delivered many tours about the preservation of the US Capitol. Um, we tried, one of my main jobs was to um, it, assist in keeping our visitation up during one of the largest restorations of the Capitol Dome, the largest restoration of the Capitol Dome that's ever taken place. And so to do that, you highlight how important restoration and preservation is of buildings. And that goes seamlessly into my first point I think it's so important to educate the public on the fact that historic structures are not static buildings. These buildings have gone through an entire life um, and are still continuing that life. And it's important for people to note that there's a lot that goes into those buildings surviving, um, those buildings continuing on into the future. Um, something that I think is really important and, and I think helps people understand um, preservation a little bit is that history is the study of an era or a topic, a specific moment in time. Historic preservation is the study of one object and all of the time it has lived, including up to the present. Um, so it's a kind of an, a different way of looking at history, but in any case, it's important to note that buildings aren't static, right? With that comes um, a great deal of maintenance, sometimes uh, small amounts of maintenance, sometimes large projects. Um, even some of our largest projects, I'll say that everything we've done in Frederick has been at this point what you would consider maintenance. We haven't changed anything, um, but it's important to do that with structures. Um, the next thing that I would focus on is appropriate maintenance, right? You can't just say, hey, I'm gonna Google this. I watched it on HGTV and I'm gonna go fix this building. It doesn't work that way. Um, basically historic materials and modern materials are vastly different. And this takes place at the turn of the century when we have um, essentially the industrial revolution, but then also um, we've got some world wars that take place and that does two things. It creates uh, quicker methods of making harder materials. So we get new materials into, um, into the industry, but then also it gets a lot of people sharing ideas, a lot of people talking to cultures and people that they've never spoken to because they are overseas, because people are here. And as a result, the transfer of information allows people to invent more, to do more things and to change materials and materiality as, as we had known it at that point. So maintenance is important, but correct maintenance is vital. 
Um, and then finally, I just want to mention that we are the stewards of these buildings. Obviously with my job, I find myself to be the steward of many buildings, but any person can be the steward of a building that they feel strongly about. That's actually why I love working for churches because I feel like I'm getting to be the steward, well, one of the stewards of a building that many people consider home. And it's so powerful. Um, so it's not just the home that you live in, but you can be the steward of places you care about, places you are, places you live and work and play. And that I think is incredibly powerful. Um, I began, what really drew me to preservation, um, I will find that as the stewards of these buildings, we are able to tell a story, to continue a legacy of the craftsmen and the people who built these structures, who in many cases otherwise do not have that story. So while I may not know the names of all of the people, however, I do find the names written in the structures almost all the time, probably not all the names, but a lot of them. Um, but this is a way that I can make their legacy persevere. And I think that that's a really powerful idea of using buildings to tell the story of someone that, that built it. Um, you can, if you look closely, you'll find thumbprints so often in buildings, you'll find people that have carved their names and a date, um, their handwriting, even in carpentry was significantly better than anything we see today. Um, but it's uh, just a really powerful uh, tool. So I want, I want to encourage you to look into preservation as a way to tell the stories, to interpret different legacies and cultures, because so much of it is there. People literally put their blood, sweat, and tears here, right? So um, it's, it's just a really powerful avenue for you to look at. So I've got the rest, and again, I don't, I don't have a lot of time, um, you know, allotted, but I, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. If you have any specific questions about materiality, about your specific structure, um, I very easily can fall down a nerdy uh, black or a nerdy rabbit hole. So please ask. Um, uh, so the question is, I did get a question just real quick, or should I answer that now or should I it's up to you. If you'd like to address it, feel sure. free. So um, the question is, Julie, do you know if enslaved or free Blacks were among the laborers and craftsmen who worked on the two Frederick church projects that I'm sharing today? I don't know. I, in many cases, I go with the assumption that yes. Um, my very, some of my very first projects were in Jamaica. And so that's truly where my passion started. So I think my first thought is always a bit to that because obviously the structures that I studied in Jamaica were 100% built by um, enslaved um, Blacks. And so I assume that. I do kind of always assume that. I have no way of, of knowing that except for I find these thumbprints and at the end of the day, a thumbprint doesn't tell you anything about skin color. So um, I, I highlight the craftsman, but I have no way of knowing. Um, so I'll just go into the restoration of, of our Frederick steeples. Again, I've only worked on, well, three steeples sort of, but two churches. Um, and at, I don't think I have control, I just say next. So next slide. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna give you just a quick project overview of the two. So they were actually very similar, All Saints Episcopal Church. Um, we did wood repairs on the louvers and the windows, um, finial replacement for the very top finial, but also the smaller turret finial. Um, those were wood finials. They, um, I'm surprised a strong gust of wind didn't blow those over. Um, but we replaced them with, uh, I believe, Spanish red cedar, and they're going to stay up there for a very, very long time. We did um, a large amount of stone repairs and then some minor masonry uh, repairs in the bricks. And then we did a full replacement of the, of the slate on the steeple and the turret roof. Um, kind of an interesting thing that we had to do, um, slate has the lifespan of typically 150 to 300 years. Um, some a little less, some a little more. Um, slate is an extremely durable material, um, but you have to treat it kindly. You have to maintain it correctly. Um, in an effort to uh, stop some leaking, 
um, the slates had actually been glued together, which caused the sheer force to actually cause cracks throughout the steeple roof. And that was something that unfortunately it can't be fixed, it must be replaced. Um, the, we used similar slate. The slate that we have now on the steeple is Vermont Black. It's an extremely durable slate. Um, and we shouldn't have to touch it for at least two decades. So <laughs> now for the Evangelical Lutheran Church, a lot of similarities, but also some major differences. Um, big similarities, the wood repairs were almost identical. You've got louvers. Frederick gets a great deal of wind from the West. Um, almost identical repairs. Obviously the wood at the same, at similar time was sourced from similar locations. So you've got a similar, um, uh, similar in-kind product. The wood repairs were very similar. Stone and masonry facade repairs, both similar and different. The facade is obviously vastly different. Um, Evangelical has a stucco finish, whereas All Saints has a brick finish, but the stone details are both the exact same kind of stone. Um, it is a brownstone from Southern Pennsylvania. It is seen throughout Frederick. In fact, I've never been to a city that has more of this brownstone featured. Um, so thankfully I had the knowledge of exactly how to fix it and, uh, and, and we did so. And then uh, also finial repairs. Um, we actually expected to have to replace it. And when we got up there, they were in decent shape. So we just repaired everything. Um, per the HPC ruling, and um, regilded both finials in gold. Um, and there was a great deal of the original gold still on there. So we expect gold is, you know, it's not a paint, it's, it's a metal when you gild it. So we expect it to last significantly uh, longer than my lifetime. That's always my barometer, typically. <laughs> Next slide. So, um, I'm just gonna quickly kind of go through these. There are a couple of before and afters. First, we'll look at All Saints. So as you can see before, even though it's about a hundred feet up in the air, you know, the wood was so deteriorated, the paint was flaking off. And then you can see the after, um, obviously repaired wood, some replaced wood, um, and then, you know, re repainted. Um, next slide. So again, um, not a great after picture, but you can just see the deterioration of the wood and then how clean and, and, and repaired it is at the end. Um, the wood in at All Saints is where we saw the majority of any, um, uh, not graffiti, it's graffiti is just not the right term, but tagging of for, uh, former craftsmen. Next slide. Um, so you can see here kind of the before, during, and after of those small dormers at the very top. Um, we did not have to replace any glass. Um, and the nice thing about wood on steeples is it's typically not rotted. It's very, very dry and brittle, but it's not rotted. So it's pretty easy to, to use to be able to save a great deal of that wood, which is really wonderful. I love saving historic fabric. It's, uh, and when I say fabric, and I don't, I don't mean fabric, I mean historic uh, material um, and steeples are a great place to do that. Next slide. So um, stone repairs at All Saints were um, invasive. I'll say, um, as you can see, the before looked relatively okay. Then the during, um, what you actually, what I'm going to point your attention to is the fact that the areas that have the stone removed there's not a lot of chisel marks. That's concerning because that means that it actually sheared off really easily, which means it could have sheared off really easily, not from a scaffold when you have workers working on it. So um, it was in great um, uh, uh, disrepair. And um, it is unfortunately that's Brownstone is very, very brittle in nature. It's um, not a super hard wearing stone, but it's also as a result, very easy to fix. So we use a product that stone patch that actually becomes part of the stone. It is stone. Um, and as you can see the almost after, I wanted to show you that before it's covered, but how we can recreate those edges um, on the stone really, really quite well. Next slide. 
Um, same thing again here. So you're seeing the before, hey, it doesn't look that bad during um, right after everything's been chipped off. Then as we build up the stone patch, um, it's not just slapped on there. Um, you actually have to build it um, and, and build it all the way up until you get back to where you're at. Next slide. Um, same thing with the area under the louvers. Um, most of this actually had to have pins installed because of where it faces. We wanted to make sure it was extra safe. Next slide. So this is the area right in, in the front doors. And I wanna point this out because you can go see it if you're walking around Frederick, but you can see the before really wasn't that bad. Um, then this is the during, that's what came off with, like I said, light tapping in some cases. And then how we were able to utilize the pieces that remained to keep those exact same profiles. Um, this is on our website. If you ever want to see kind of this, um, the you know this kind of before, during, and after. Um, we had a quick question: How are the projects funded? Um, we are a for-profit company. Um, the churches typically fund these projects with different capital campaigns. We are always, um, I'm al I always try to be as helpful as I can with grants. If I find any, I send them on over. Um, but also, um, you know, it really is up to the church to, to fund these. Um, churches can't utilize tax credits because they are nonprofit entities, um, but other, other groups do. Um, and there are a great deal of grants. We just finished, or last on Friday, finished a project at Asbury Methodist in DC, um, which is a traditionally, it's actually, I believe the first black Methodist church in the DC area. And it, uh, they were able to get um, a lot of grants because there's a lot available for, um, or for black churches. So uh, it just depends. So grants, um, capital campaigns, sometimes you have, kind of someone that's left a lot of money for the church and said, hey, I wanna fix the roof. Uh, you know, that does happen. So um, I don't fund them, but, but I do help as much as I can with fundraisers and that sort of thing. Next slide. So again, this is right there at the base of, the, of All Saints. Uh, again, before, during, and after. That one did look bad in the before. We knew what we were gonna find. <laughs> Next slide. So once again, before and after, next slide. And so here I want, to see, I want you to see the roof replacement. Um, one key thing that I want to point out that um, Durable always highlights, and I just want to share it with everyone because I think it's very important. If you look at the after, if you look in between each of the slates, you see a tiny little white dot. It's actually a stainless steel uh, roof hook that basically is just an extra protection to keep those slates inside or attached to the building while still allowing it to move like it should. Um, we use those particularly on very vertical roofs, very vertically pitched roofs, just an extra layer of protection that um, is now, when we, were do when we did All Saints in 2016, not many people were doing it. Um, and now most of the industry um, does this. It's really important um, and it allows the building to function the way it should and, and resist any sort of ongoing damage from weather or um, big storms, things like that. Because um, it's not easy to get up there and change a single slate. <laughs> um, this also highlights the first thing that goes wrong with slate roofs. It's not the slate. It's never the slate. Typically, it's the uh, metal flashing or the metal, in this case, ridge roll. Um, just something to note, um, copper has a lifespan of about 100 years before it really needs replacing. Next slide. Um, another before, and this is during, um, but you can see the, the during. Um, next. Um, so that was the before of the <laughs> of the finial. Uh, we were able to find some historic uh, photographs of what was originally there, and then had um, had this made by one of our um, close um, friends in Winchester. He carved it by hand. Next slide. 
So now we're working at Evangelical Lutheran. I think this is a really interesting image. Um, I just real quick, you see the before it all looks brown. It looks like there's wood underneath. But when we actually scraped the paint off, you can see there's actually um, close to 12 different paint colors. Not There's far more layers. Um, but everything from really a deep stained wood to almost a slate blue, then you've got an evergreen, even a bright yellow at one point, then a dark green, and then actually the, um, the taupe color that we know it today. So again, this is at Evangelical Lutheran at the Twin Spires. This is at the very, very top. This is um, where the roof meets the, uh, the facade. So just really fascinating to think what it, you know, those, those black and white photos don't show you color. And it really is fascinating what, what it might've looked like before. Um, next slide. So again, here, um, the wood was in just really rough shape. Now, some, uh, some people have asked me while we're working, well, why aren't we replacing the roof? Um, so this is a lead coated copper roof and it's in great shape. It lead coated copper is extremely durable. Um, the lead gives the copper coating about another hundred years of life. So it's doing great. We didn't replace it because it didn't need it. Um, so, but it, the wood definitely had the same problems as All Saints and, and we did repair it um, the same way. Uh, next slide. So as you can see here, kind of the, uh, the multitude of layers of paint that were coming off and then the after. Um, we didn't have to replace too many louvers. Um, we did a lot of repair on this. Next slide. So I want to show you, um, I know some of you probably walk by this building all the time and you think, wow, it looks the same as it did. So bright, so white. Um, just look at the before. That's what it looked like before. Don't forget. <laughs> um, this is obviously immediately after it was painted. Um, and we're not painting it with paint. It's We're using a mineral coating that actually allows the building to still have the same vapor permeability. So any water or moisture that's inside the building can still come out um, while still being a bit hydrophobic so that water doesn't enter in through the wall. So um, this is a product uh, that's German. It's used across the United States. It's one of the oldest um, mineral coating, modern mineral coating com companies out there because obviously people have been using it for eons. Um, it's highly researched and, and one of the best products on the market. So we were thrilled to be able to, to utilize it um, at Evangelical Lutheran. Next slide. So again, you see what we were talking about with the delamination of a former, um, of a former coating that did not agree with the stucco below it. All of that was scraped off, repaired where needed, and then recoded. Next slide. Again, um, this is the same corner pictured, um, the far corner here on the left of the after. You can see how bad and just, it was really, really black in a lot of places. A lot of decay and gray and green and not so great. And then the new paint um, coating, not paint, uh, will take care of all that. Keep it nice and clean. Next. Um, so similar repairs. Um, on the brownstone, as you can see the before and after. Uh, next slide. Again, we're seeing really similar repairs. This is one of the, um, you've got one of the lower windows here for the before, um, and then I've got a louver, similar base uh, sill, but as you can see, um, the reason that they don't match is they're still um, curing at this point in the afters. Next slide. I have my, um, uh, we have a, a, a team that photographs our building when we're done and they're coming on Tuesday. They were supposed to come two weeks ago. And so I was really excited about getting you beautiful glamor shots of Evangelical. And uh, we had some delays due to COVID. So they're coming next week. So you get my iPhone photos. <laughs> I apologize. Um, but you can see a whole piece that was completely missing in the before and then how, um, how my folks, uh, my um, my masons rebuilt it, and my masons are absolutely incredible. They're such artisans, such artists, and they do such a great job. Next slide. So I want to show you um, an up close and personal 
of the finials. They're absolutely stunning. As you can see that before, um, most of the gold uh, had come off. And, um, uh, and then when they were regilled, um, at just absolutely stunning. And, and a lot more, it's not simply um, looks, it's, it's really a very durable coating. Uh, gold gilding was often used outside historically because of its durability. Next slide. Um, so you can see the before, if you look closely, you can see some of that gold gilding that was there on those finial pieces. Uh, they're just strung, strung on there as if it's a necklace or a bracelet, if you can believe it. Um, and so we were able to remove them, uh, repair them, or a couple had to be replaced, um, and then re-gild re them and reinstall them. Um, the question is, is there a wooden base in case by plaster or are the sills entirely reconstructed out of plaster? They're completely, re there's no wood um, in the sills. It was originally one large stone sill and then we've actually just repaired the stone with stone patch. So no plaster, just stone, stone patch, and that's it. Um, so anyway, that's the before and afters of the finials. Um, and those photos are so special. They're from one of my craftsmen who um, has uh, no fear of heights whatsoever, clearly. <laughs> um, next slide. Um, so that's the two videos uh, upon completion. We're so proud of them. I, and if you can believe it, the weather vane that points is taller than me when stood up. So it's, it's, they don't look big, but they're absolutely enormous. Next slide. And then this is the base right underneath the gold gilt um, um, finials. Uh, what I wanna point out is these were actually in great shape, a surprising amount. There were a few areas that had to be um, re-soldered, repaired, um, and, and we did that. Um, but those are wood encased in lead-coated copper. We replaced it with um, zinc-coated. It, it's a, not lead-coated copper because it's not, um, people don't, want to work with it, rightfully so. Um, but this is a product that um, works seamlessly with lead-coated copper, looks the same as it ages, um, and is a really great product. It's called uh, Freedom Gray. Um, yeah, you can see a hand because that's how we fix them. <laughs> um, so I'm sure you guys can see that we, uh, we, you know, we unfortunately had to close off a lot of streets. We had the largest lift available in the United States. Um, out there for quite a, a bit, um, but that's that was the best way to, it's not the way we had intended to do it, but it ended up being the best way to um, to repair those finials. So yeah, that's Paul Ostrello. I wanna highlight him because I, whenever I have these crazy projects, I always just call him, he's out of Ohio. He worked on All Saints and then he's worked on um, Evangelical and he, like I said, no fear of heights and one of the most dedicated and detail-oriented craftsmen I have. Next slide. Um, the last thing we did, uh, we replaced, this is actually the only place in Frederick that we've replaced something not in kind. Um, this was originally a copper roof. It was replaced at some point over the over time um, with uh, essentially a tin roof. Um, and they actually did something that was a little strange. They put standing seam on the lower roof and then flat lock on the upper roof. That doesn't make sense. Um, standing seam should only be on pitched roofs of a certain pitch. Flat lock should only be on roofs that are very low pitch. So we actually replaced, switched that out and we did it all in copper. Um, and I don't have any good after shots, so I'm very sorry, but this is what you can see. I'm sure if you walk by, you'll be just, the glint of the copper assaults you because it's so stunning. Um, and so this actually had been causing a little bit of water intrusion and that was repaired by switching the roofs to the correct pitches. Um, I believe this is my last screen, but next slide. Oh, no, you got another before and after. That's my last slide, I believe. Um, so um, let me get to some of the questions I've got. Um, okay. Um, I think Maryland Historic Preservation tax credits might work for a range of nonprofits and the Maryland Heritage Areas Authority or Maryland Historical Trust grants are a possibility. 
Also, the Delaplane Foundation would entertain a church historic preservation project. That's absolutely true. Um, it depends on how, you know, if you have, a, sometimes if churches have schools on site, they can use the tax credits. Again, um, I'm, I, I'm able to share that information in the sense that it's out there. I'm just not completely an expert on it. But if you go to durablerestoration.com, there's actually an area where we have grants and we have it per um, area. So there's a Maryland one. Feel free to check it out. Um, and we're updating that whenever we find new grants. Um, photos are great, details and conditions very clear. Thanks, they're not glamour shots, but I can find the conditions and the materiality, which is what my job is. So that's why they're like that. Um, then I already answered the wooden base and case by plaster, the wow, you can see a hand and a bird's nest. Yes, um, lots of bird's nests. You know, they're crazy, those birds. There's a lot of bees nests, very high. Um, lot. Whenever I, I, I hear about bees not doing so well, I always think to myself, I see a lot of them, but just much higher than the population of, of humans. <laughs> I'm not saying that they're not, not doing well, but you know, just know they're just living above you. <laughs> um, so we've got the before and after photos are amazing, beautiful work. Jacob Engelbrecht describes in his diary, painters hanging on ropes and repainting the twin spires of Evangelical Lutheran. Yes, and there are photos of this. And at the very beginning of our CEO's time, that's how slates were fixed too. Uh, boat swing chairs are absolutely terrifying. Um, I can't believe people do it. You literally tie a rope at the top of a building and then you just on a swing, Get yourself down there. Sounds terrifying. I would never do it, but uh, there are photos of people doing that. So we preserve that craftsmanship um, in significantly safer ways um, that are all OSHA compliant. <laughs> um, and then had there been a previous large restoration of Evangelical Lutheran? Curious how many years of deterioration all this is. Apologies if this was mentioned. And how much time before new copper patinas? So um, there had been a previous, the last really large restoration of Evangelical Lutheran was in the 1960s when they actually stripped off all of the stucco and restuccoed the entire facade of the entire structure. Um, however, that stucco was then later coated or painted. It's unsure as to when. Um, Marsha might, she probably knows. Um, but the product that was used just somehow wasn't super compatible. So that's what we were actually taking off a lot of um, the time. Um, so, but then other things have been fixed as time has gone on. So how many years of deterioration all this is? As I mentioned, buildings aren't static. So the facade, probably about 50 to 60 years. Um, the roof, that's that's since its inception. So in the 1950, 1850s, excuse me. The wood, um, I would say that the wood was about 75% original, 25% replaced wood when we scraped off the, the paint. Um, so there definitely have been repairs. All of the wood is actually pretty easily accessible from inside the steeple, so repairs could be made, um, but it's a mystery as to when that would have been repaired. Um, and then the exterior roof, the tin roof, I'll say, don't quote me on this, my thought is that it was likely done in the early 1900s, um, early to mid. I can't, I can't be sure, but again, um, Marsha might know more. Um, and then how much time before new copper patinas? Approximately two minutes. <laughs> it's, it starts off so bright orange pink and literally within a couple days, it's already toned down significantly. Now, copper is not, is no longer going to patina to that verdigris color that we're familiar with, um, a, a color similar to, to this kind of blue. Um, simply because of the atmosphere that, that our world is in um, and because of the different chemicals that are within our atmosphere. It patinas now to a brown color um, that you, you know, you're, you're likely familiar with, with dark copper. Um, to get that green verdigris, we actually now have to um, 
chemically manufacture that within our warehouses to do so. So whether we're matching a copper roof or if someone has specifically asked for a green verdigree um, roof, that actually has to be chemically manufactured. Um, what you're going to see on all of the copper that is simply installed is it will patina quite quickly within about six months, it's already to that brown color. So um, the, the photo I showed um, of the copper standing seam roof, that was probably a week after it had been installed. And I'm sure if you go out there right now, I mean, I was up there a couple days ago, um, it's already pretty dull um, and, and dark. Now, again, patina is, it's part of the life cycle of that material and it's what's expected. It's, yeah. The name of the German mineral coating product is, um, that's the next question. Sorry, what was the name of the German mineral coating product? Um, it's called Keim is the company. There's, they have a lot of different products for very specialized um, uh, materials. So I work very closely. We are a Keim certified company. Not many companies are. Um, I work very closely with the Keim company getting the um, foundation of the building, uh, the substrate tested. Uh, to, to figure out exactly which product or group of products is the best for that specific building. But it's called KIEM, K-I-E-M, or K-E-I-M, I'm a bit dyslexic. Anyway, look it up. Um, it's a really fascinating um, product. It's used uh, a great deal over very, very important structures. Um, very important. I mean, the, the US Capitol uses it, it's, yeah. How tall are the steeples on Evangelical Lutheran? Um, my lift was 180 feet tall. So about that tall. <laughs> That's as tall as we went. Um, but that's, I can't, I, I, we didn't ever measure it 100%. It was taller than we expected when we put the scaffold up, I'll tell you that. Um, if there are any other questions, please feel free to reach out to me. My email is jbutler at durablerestoration.com. Um, like I said, I very quickly fall down rabbit holes um, about very minute aspects of buildings. So if you uh, have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, if you have any buildings that you need us to come look at, please. Um, we, like I said, we've not just worked on, on churches in Frederick, we've worked on a great deal of different buildings. Um, and if you just have any questions, um, generally, also happy to answer. Julie, I lost track there for a minute. Did you see Lynn's question about the um, if the sills were entirely reconstructed from plaster? Yes, so they're not reconstructed from plaster at all. It is a stone patch material. There's no wood below it. It is a full piece of brownstone where just the front surface has actually delaminated. Um, and that's what we repair that front detail, typically. Great, thank you. Does anybody, oh, here's a new message. Oh, the thank three chairs of the rabbit hole. <laughs> if anyone else has a question for Julie, now the time is to throw it in there. And thank you so much, Julie. Marsha, did you have anything to say? If you're still out there, I believe you are. And thank you for, to Marsha for making sure we could we get Julie. Um, I had talked to Marsha about that because I kept going past the scaffolding and I wanted to know more, so. Well, what I can clarify is that uh, according to our written history, the towers uh, raised to a height of 150 feet. Uh, one has to wonder if maybe that was before the weather vanes. So it could be that the weather vane adds to that. I would, uh, I would say it does by likely about 15 feet. And as to the question about when we have um, last touched this building, keep in mind that what we have currently are in the process of finishing is just the front facade. So when Julie was talking about the roof, for instance, she's talking just about the roof of the two steeples. Is that correct, Julie? Yes, yes. that's, I'm sorry, that's correct. Um, I'm, we're just speaking about the two steeples, the roof on the rear of the building was slate previously and was replaced with asphalt shingle. And I believe, yeah. 
And I believe we are currently looking at having to replace it again, according to a recent uh, article in our church newsletter. So keep in mind, uh, this building is more than just the front facade on Church Street. It goes all the way back into our property. And there's even a portion of the original limestone church that was built in the 1700s that is considered part of this church building. And so there's hardly a decade that, uh, from what I've been able to gather in our history, that we haven't touched either the inside or the outside of this particular building. It's an ongoing labor of love. And yes, we had a, uh, we had a very robust capital campaign team put together to raise funds and many of, and one subset of that team did look specifically at um, grant funding opportunities. So we have looked into a lot of that and we're somewhat successful. We also, um, of course, our members are very generous. It, we have made commitments to a multi-year um, commitment to paying. And we were also fortunate that we were able to um, sell some rental properties and that gave a big influx into the capital campaign this time. And we are also blessed that we have an endowment and we were able to use some of the funds from the endowment for this as well. So the capital campaign has multiple aspects to it uh, that have been able to, and it's still ongoing. We still have a couple of years of, uh, of member commitments that will be coming in. So it's uh, not, we're not done yet, even though Julie's, Julie's company may be done with their work, we're not done yet. And at the same time, we were also working on things like, um, you might've seen in some of the pictures, the stained glass windows up in that front vestibule came out and were refurbished. And now we're going to start uh, a longer term project on refurbishing the other stained glass windows that are actually in the sanctuary. So as Julie said, these buildings require constant tender loving care and we're just blessed that it's our opportunity to do this now, just as every generation in our church beforehand had done their part since it was originally built. Uh, as to Liz's question about whether enslaved persons were used, um, I don't believe we have any uh, record of that in our history, other than perhaps one, was, one might have contributed to that original limestone church built in the 1760s. Thank so you. I think, that, I think that answers all of the questions that kind of came up in the in, during this. Yeah. Also, thank you, Marsha, for that. And you may be contacted by a Hood student about just that topic. Okay. I think there's something to to consider um, when the church was built in the in the 1760s. My my research, and again, this is it's not specifically about this building, um, has found you have to consider that you were very much. Um, out west, very much into a new frontier, and that the construction was paused for this specific building for the French and Indian War. Not, um, not a great deal of enslaved people um, fought in that war, but it's not to say that it didn't happen. Um, it's just something to consider that you wouldn't have had um, a lot of agriculture or um, it's just it's something to consider kind of the 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 time and place how it is vastly different than the frederick we know of the last hundred years yeah actually we have that as part of our history of that particular part of the building too that it was the this, the construction of that part of it was paused for about seven years because of the war and by the time the war was over and the men came back they pretty much had to start over because the lot had been come so overgrown again uh, so that, that is part of, but um, yeah, so we're, we're very fortunate that we have a written published history of the first 250 years of our congregation. And so some of this information we've been able to pull out of that history book. But I think there's a great deal of research to be done. And again, like I said, the majority of a, a big part of my passion for why I do this and why I want to do this every day is being able to continue the legacy of the craftsmen, whoever they were, who built these structures. They're some of the truly greatest craftspeople that have ever lived, and yet we have no, tell, no story of them. So 
if this is a small contribution that Durable can make of preserving these structures to tell that legacy that maybe in the future there will be a way to tell who did what, I don't know, who knows what the future will bring. But um, I think it's important to preserve the legacy of those that built these buildings. And that's that's what gets me up in the morning, so. <laughs> And Julie, I don't know if you remember, but didn't your workers find a board in one of the steeples that was signed by some previous workers? Um, it's not a board. It's actually, um, if you just go up into the steeple, not that I suggest people break into the steeples, but it's right there. Actually, it's very accessible. It's on the um, on all of the main uh, timbers that um, are structural. Um, there's not just one. There's every timber is signed by several people. And was that in both steeples or just the east or west? Um, both steeples, okay. primarily in the west one, but both steeples have it. And then some of um, some of them, I believe the bricks have actually been carved out as well. And what's interesting about the question that was asked previously uh, in terms of um, different times that the building's been repaired, that actually you can kind of tell that because people will leave the, the year often. Um, and so you can tell that different people from different decades have definitely worked on it. So I guess that you could maybe categorize that and, and see. <laughs> um, there is a question. Um, these steeples were probably worked on by men who were later Civil War soldiers. That's more than likely. I mean, built in 1853, fair to say that. Um, uh, where are our tradesmen getting their training? Um, so we actually do a lot of training internally. We have a very robust training program, um, uh, which goes into, uh, is part of our very, very intense quality control program. Um, knowing these historic materials and the materiality and relationships is so, so important. But we also, of course, do go to other places to do training. Um, so we train um, primarily in, in, Three different places. So Kaim, obviously, we've trained. We've trained with them. Um, we've trained with uh, Cathedral Stone, who um, is one of the best stone patch products that that we use. So we've done training with them, so that we're certified for for that. And then also, um, uh, this is all a shameless plug because I really love these companies. But LimeWorks up in um, Pennsylvania, in my opinion, has some of the best um, historic mortar training in the country. And all of these places are actually really close to Frederick. So, <laughs> um, but we do internally train almost um, everyone. Some people come in with a little bit of experience, um, but we internally train everyone. Anything else from anybody? Again, thank you so much, Julie. We appreciate your taking the time out of your schedule to join us here today. And again, thank you, Marsha, for making it happen. Thanks, everyone. I was happy to be here. Have a great day. Bye-bye.